Welcome, my name is Truman Bradley. I'm the Executive Director of the Marijuana Industry Group. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties that we've had. Uh, it's March 25th, 2021, which means I should know how to work Zoom, but I don't. So I will put a dollar in the jar because that's what we do nowadays, but uh, better late than never. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this group today. What we've done is MIG has partnered with the Cannabis Certification Council to put together a series of deep dives on best management practices around sustainability and cannabis. And what we've done is brought in experts for every, every series, every panel. And today we're gonna to be talking about organic waste. And if that doesn't excite you, it should, because we generate a lot of it here. And as everybody knows, Colorado has been a pioneer, has been a leader in the cannabis space really since inception. And it's on us to continue to be leaders here when it comes to sustainability. It's one of Governor Polis's wildly important goals. It's something the Marijuana Enforcement Division is focused on. And it's something that as somebody who grew up in Colorado, it's near and dear to my heart. And I couldn't be more excited to listen and learn to the panelists today. I hope that this is the first of a bunch of meetings that um, you attend and that I attend because it's on us. We have the ability to make this green industry greener and it, it's on us to do that collectively. And so that's my hope today that you listen, you learn, you participate and you come away with something actionable that you can take back to your space, whatever's relevant to you. I'm not gonna introduce each speaker um, I'm not sure if Ben's going to do that or if we'll leave that to the speakers, but I'm excited to be here and thank you to Ben and to all of the speakers who have donated their time today. Let's get it started. Truman, thank you so much. My name is Ben Gelt. I'm the board chair of the Cannabis Certification Council. It's such a pleasure to partner with Truman and Kat from MIG and their membership to put together this series of deep dive events. As Truman said, today we're going to be focused on organic waste. Um, in future events, we'll be covering IPM, water, plastic waste, and energy. We're also exploring other events that we'd like to do uh, to help the industry become more sustainable. So we're gonna start very quickly today with just a very brief survey for those of you that are with us live. Um, it's just four questions. Um, so Max, if you can put that up as I vamp a little bit, I would appreciate it. Um, and if folks could just quickly respond, there's only four questions here. Max, that's actually the, oh, I'm seeing the results, <laughs> excuse me. I think viewers are seeing something different. So if folks could please respond to that um, and just let us know a little bit about who you are um, and, and just what, what you're doing, how you operate. Um, it, it's not deep, it should only take maybe 30 seconds for each of you to do that. So while we leave the, the poll up for just a moment longer, I will quickly introduce um, the folks that we have here on our panel, and then we'll get us started. So I'm just gonna go uh, across the screen as I see it. So it's in no particular order. So I hope no one takes any offense. Um, we already saw Truman. Thank you again, Truman. I also wanna say good morning to Kat Cottesbody from, from MIG. She does such a wonderful job supporting Truman and, and working with MIG and has been a great, great partner. Um, next, we have John Whiteside from IHR Recycling. He'll be here uh, to talk to us about waste management. Uh, IHR is a waste management company in the cannabis space here in the Denver metro area. Caitlin Urso, our great friend from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and a cannabis sustainability superstar, Colorado and beyond, will be talking to us about the uh, regulatory kind of perspective on these issues. Uh, we have Tanner Phelps from A1 Organics and also Clinton Sander from A1 Organics. They are the largest commercial composter in the state of Colorado, also the only one. Um, and a waste receiver will be talking about uh, what, what they need to see from the industry to really maximize uh, sustainability. Next, we have Brandon Rea, made of roots, their head of science and sustainability, a wonderful resource for the public at the council um, and going to provide the cultivator's perspective today. So I think I've vamped long enough to give the, the poll a good amount of time. So Max, if you want to close it out, I would appreciate it. And we will turn it over to Caitlin Urso, who's going to start us off with just a brief overview of what the rules regarding organic waste were and the rule changes that came into place. Uh, really, the process took place last summer and then we're 
uh, promulgated the critical term of January 1st. So, Caitlin, thank you so much. Welcome. And go ahead, take over. All right, I remember to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> so hi, everybody. Uh, as, as Ben said, Caitlin Urso, I'm with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, my role is to be a free sustainability consultant, free environmental consultant for all small businesses in Colorado. We classify a small business as 100 employees or less. Um, I personally specialize in helping the, the marijuana and craft brewing industries. Um, two small business, primarily small business sectors in our state that have uh, a high environmental impact, use a lot of energy, a lot of water, generate waste, um, things like that. So my role is to basically be all three, all things environmental. Um, I do one-on-one -on -one site visits. I do compliance assistance. I coordinate projects. I do a lot of research. Um, I'm an environmental educator and speaker, what I'm doing today. I am a regulatory resource and advisor. I helped MED with the most recent rule changes that we're gonna talk about that really opened the door um, to access to composting for the marijuana industry here in Colorado, which is really exciting. I also do one-on-one -on -one calls and group workshops, um, generate a lot of industry specific guidance. I'm heading up the best management practices team for the Denver County Cannabis Sustainability Work Group, which um, CCC is also very involved in. So my contact information is here. Feel free to reach out to me directly at any time. Um, shoot me an email, uh, call my cell. This main website here at the bottom is the state's main website that links to all our environmental sustainability resources for the cannabis industry, including the Denver County guidance documents um, and a couple of uh, outside resources as well. So cover the types of businesses I help, but just to give you an idea outside of cannabis um, and, and craft brewing, Think dry cleaners, auto body shops, print shops, hospitals, schools, anybody with an engine, a boiler, um, doing construction activities, anybody that has an environmental impact is able and eligible uh, to receive my assistance. So just to point out a couple of guidance documents before we get into the topic today, NCIA has a really great new guidance document out about the environmental impacts best management practices and policy considerations for the cannabis industry. There is a waste chapter. Um, they do talk about the best practices for organic waste in this guidance document. Um, really great reference if you haven't seen it already. And then also to point out our Denver County work group guidance documents that are available. We did have an update in 2020. Those will be available on the website soon. He's, here are the, the ones available from uh, 2019. And then the group for this year, uh, for the 2021 group, we do have new, uh, you know, new guidance that will come out as well. We're hoping to have a new chapter on climate change this year, which I'm really excited about. So talking about organic waste, I really briefly want to touch on where Colorado was and, and you know, where we are today. And so I think everybody's very familiar with the previous marijuana plant waste regulations that basically said all marijuana plant waste must be rendered unusable and unrecognizable before leaving the licensed uh, premises. And that has to result in at least uh, a mixture that's at least 50% non-marijuana waste. And this uh, rule was also adopted by um, Michigan, uh, Maine, Washington, Nevada, Illinois is pretty common. Oregon also has a 50-50 rule. Um, this is very common place regulation for marijuana plant waste. And the intent of the rule was safety, security, and uh, no illicit market diversion. Basically, we don't want people getting into this marijuana waste, um, you know, diverting it to the illicit market or causing, causing any sort of you know, public safety issues. So the intent of the rule was not to double the landfill waste footprint. And that's essentially what it did in, inadvertently. So there was some unintended consequences of the rule. Um, it's oftentimes, so you have to double your waste footprint. You have to mix with 50% non-marijuana waste. And it, a lot of times it was really hard for cultivators to find a 50% you know, uh, additive that was organic waste stream in order to be able to compost. And if they did, oftentimes they were importing new organic waste materials like shredded cardboard or something like that that hadn't previously be, been used um, to be able to compost to meet that 50-50 mix requirement. This was a barrier to composting. Um, it also increased costs of composting because oftentimes composting is charged per pound of pickup. And so if you have to double your pounds of pickup, you're doubling your cost to, to be able to um, compost. So really we, we wanted to see if we could keep the original intent of the rule, 
that safety, security, and preventing illicit market diversion, but make it um, a little bit more environmentally friendly. So before we, we talk about the new rule, when we talk about environmentally friendly, what is the, the impact of, of not composting this material, of sending it to landfill? So in 2019, based on the um, Marijuana Enforcement Division's available data, about 3,650 tons of marijuana plant waste was generated in Colorado. Um, when we double that for the 50-50 waste mixing rule, that comes out to about uh, 7,300 tons of material going to landfill. If we were to divert all of that from, from landfill to composting, um, we would get a greenhouse gas reduction of about 122 metric tons or about 17 households worth of annual energy consumption. Um, not to mention the benefits of recovering all of those nutrients. There's, there's, a, there's beneficial nutrients within the plant material that can be utilized. And so just thinking about the environmental impact of that. And this is also why too, you know, we don't wanna double our waste stream, right? We only wanna to, want to compost what's necessary. So um, we did have some previous, you know, rule changes that tried to get up making uh, plant waste uh, disposal more sustainable. We had the fiber recovery exemption, where if your stalks and stems could be exempt um, from that 50-50 mixing rule, if they were going to industrial fiber recycling and repurposing, uh, we didn't see good implementation of this rule. Um, and then we also allowed for better access to composting through the mobile waste rendering rule, where it basically allowed the 50-50 mixing to take place in the truck on site. Um, again, that didn't have good implementation and it really limited the size of operation that could have accessibility to that mobile rendering. Our really large operators have more um, plant waste in a day than what could be you know, mixed 50-50 in, in the back of a truck. So, that brings us to the changes. Um, in 2020, we had our extensive stakeholder process with the MED, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, to meet with stakeholders to say, okay, how can we keep this original intent of safety, security, no illicit market diversion, but have more sustainable options for our plant waste disposal? And so what was came up with was these new um, methods that are exempt from the 50-50 requirement. Essentially, if you're um, composting, doing anaerobic digestion, biochar, gasification, a more sustainable method than sending it to landfill, um, you can exempt your stalks, stems, leaves, and roots, basically your low THC content material into going to that, that directly um, without, without having to mix. Um, you know, some other, you don't have to mix your post extractive material if it's gonna be on site, but if it's gonna be off site by a third party, it does have to be mixed. Uh, so it really, it really provides some flexibility uh, to what can be done. It also allows uh, regulated marijuana businesses to use that, that in product from the compost back within their own operation or within another operation. So you can actually take advantage of those uh, nutrient benefits within your own operation now. So if you really, really wanna get into the details and the nitty gritty of the rules, um, that first link provided on this slide is where you can find the actual red line rules for all the rule changes that took place um, and that took effect January 1st of this year. Uh, the organic waste rules start on page 96. There's also some updates to the consumer packaging rules, which start on page 102. There's also a link to um, a very in-depth MED presentation that talks about the rule changes as well. I do wanna highlight just really briefly some of what I think are the most important parts of the rule um, to point out for clarity is so stock stems, root balls and grow media can be composted on site or off site without the 50-50 mixing. You, you can just compost it right there. This also allows for, like I said, those other sustainable methods like anaerobic digestion, biochar, biomass gasification. The action of composting is meeting your unusable and unrecognizable requirement, um, whether that's, that's on-site or off-site. The action of composting is meeting that part of the rule. Composting does require a waste management plan, basically you know, a written plan of how you're gonna manage this material, um, what's gonna be mixed, what's not gonna be mixed, those types of things. If it's gonna be composted off-site, it requires a written contract between the license holder and the composter. So 
one thing, uh, some of the questions that have come up that, that we've kind of um, in implementing this rule where we found some clarity is post extracted plant waste is only exempt from the 50-50 waste mixing rule if it's composted on site at a licensed facility. So your licensed facility or another licensed facility. If that post extracted plant waste is composted by an unlicensed, meaning um, non-marijuana licensed, third party, it must be mixed and, and rendered first. It still falls under that requirement. Um, the next point of clarity is if a third party waste hauler is used to transport the marijuana plant waste to a composter, both the hauler and the composter have to have written in contracts in place with the cultivator. Basically, if you are going to be um, coming in contact with this, this marijuana plant waste, you need to have a written contract with the cultivator, with the license holder. So if we have a third party waste hauler, contracts with the hauler, and then also contracts with the in composter. So that's the, the overview of the rules. Um, the, you know, the next part of this is it's, we were each asked to do our, our kind of our five ta top take home points of this. And so I'll roll right into my top five since I, I have the floor and, and kind of did the overview is really what I want um, you as license holders to get out of this. You know, what is the point? Why are we talking today? Understand that the org organic marijuana waste rules have changed. That's the first thing. There's a change that has taken place and it now allows for easier composting of stock stems, um, fan leaves and root balls without having to mix with that 50% non-marijuana waste. That's huge. Cultivators, this means you should side stream those waste, uh, those waste streams, the uh, stock stems, fan leaves and root balls for compost pickups and not be mixing them, but you still need to mix the basically the high THC uh, content material, um, buds, post-extracted material, things like that, sugar leaves. Um, next slide. Uh, so remember that waste haulers need written contracts with cultivators to accept this types of, these types of waste as compost. Um, work with the compost facilities to understand what material can and cannot be composted. Um, depending on who the composter is, for example, they may or may not accept your grow media in with your with your compost mix. And it can depend on what that grow media is. Um, and again, uh, I think I already said this, but side streaming uh, your your material, understand that it has both economic and environmental benefit. There is reasons for doing this. Um, you get those uh, those greenhouse gas reduction benefits out of it. Um, and you can also save some money without having to have your staff mixing and grinding um, and spending that time to do that. So that's it for me. Um, here again is my contact information, the website where you can find more information um, about all things environmental ca cannabis sustainability in Colorado. Um, and yeah, thank you all for having me. Caitlin, thank you. Um, and just for the audience quickly, what we did is asked all of our panelists today to come with at least five things um, that we could give our audience to take away for, for steps, for measures that they can implement today that are compliant, that are economically viable, um, and that improve your sustainability profile and, and operations. So um, there's our first five from our regulator, Caitlin Urso. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, next on the list, we have Tanner Phelps and Clinton Sander from A1 Organics. Again, A1 is a, is a commercial composter, so they are the waste receiver. They are, in, in many cases, going to be the end point of where all this stuff goes. So Tanner, I see you're unmuted, so I'll pick on you. Welcome. Good morning. And uh, go ahead and take it away, man. Well, hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, Clinton should be pulling up the uh, slides that we have, so we can just go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Yeah, um, my name is Clinton Sander. And uh, Caitlin, thank you for that great breakdown. We're going to have a little bit of repetition here, but I think that's really great uh, to kind of reinforce a few things. Um, so yeah, I am Clinton Sander from A1 Organics. I'm the marketing manager and Tanner Phelps is with me as well. He's one of our technical managers at A1. And um, we're excited to be able to help and offer our assistance in the, uh, the composting industry and what we know and our expertise of what can break down and how things can break down and also what contamination can cause to this, to our stream, our side of the world. Um, just briefly to talk about A1, hold on a second, sorry, this is dropping down here in my way. 
So A1 Organics, we've been around 46 years. We've been around a long time and we are, kind of, we are a leader in the organics recycling industry. Um, we're known nationally and uh, we partner with a lot of national groups on composting in the industry. We do have four facilities across the state. Um, two of our composting, commercial composting facilities, one's in Keensburg, one is in Eaton. And then basically we have green waste recycling centers in Commerce City, Inglewood and Eaton. The Kingsburg facility is a commercial site for commercial hauling in and out, um, but it is, a, it is specifically uh, designed for that purpose. Um, yeah, we, we recycle over 425,000 tons of diverted uh, green waste and food waste, you name it, anything that was once living, we can compost it. And um, uh, we're just really proud to be uh, the sustainable solution for Colorado. Next, I'm gonna let Tanner jump in here. Tanner and I are gonna kind of tag team this back and forth. He's gonna kind of reiterate a little bit of what Catlin or Caitlin talked about. So go ahead, Tanner. Yeah, so this is a little bit of repetition from what Caitlin said earlier, but uh, to reiterate the green waste is just the stalks, stems, fan leaves and roots. And so green waste is kind of a composting term a little bit, but that just means that we'll just use that as plant material in the composting process. So we would like to receive that material as is. Um, the new regulations say that that doesn't have to be mixed with any other material. And from a composting standpoint, it's much easier for us to use and process if you do separate it, like Caitlin was saying, and have a side stream of these uh, not as regulated materials and then a side stream of the registered marijuana waste that has to be 50-50 mixed. And that 50-50 mixed material is just like she was saying, that would be the buds, flowers, the THC containing plant parts. And that would also be any unusable or unsaleable products. So say edibles or tinctures, um, but those would have to be removed from all packaging. So say you have an edible in a little plastic container that would have to be removed from the plastic container um, before it's sent to us. We don't really have a process. There's not somebody sitting there at our site, you know, pulling everything out of plastic, pulling everything out of packaging. So uh, by the time it arrives to our site, it pretty much needs to be ready to go right into a compost pile. Great, thanks, Tanner. And, um, and another big point that we wanna reiterate here is knowing what you can mix. Uh, we know that CDPHE uh, gave a good detailed list of what blending materials you can use as your 50-50 blend uh, material. Uh, some of that is, is pretty concerning to us in the commercial composting industry, specifically because of contamination potential and factor. Um, and a good example, like boxes, there's a lot of box material out there. Yes, we understand that. But if those boxes are being blended, there cannot be any labels on that box. There cannot be any tape, remaining tape on that box. Um, the box, you know, it has to be a specific clean piece of cardboard. Uh, we see the same thing with paper waste. Uh, a lot of people like to use shredded paper material. Um, again, yes, we can compost paper, but a lot of times the material in that shredded paper will have plastic windows from an envelope or it'll be a credit card that had been, had been ground up into that material. There's still a high contamination factor within those materials. Same with food waste. We can see a lot of things in there as simply as a fruit sticker. A fruit sticker on an apple will be a contamination for a commercial composter. And it's, it's something that's extremely challenging to get out of the stream. We, not, we can't 100% get it out. So A1 is really uh, requiring if you're gonna send this is specific to the 50-50 blend. If you're gonna do the 50-50 blend, we ask that you use ground lumber, um, I'm sorry, ground limb, log, brush, grass, leaves, straw, or clean non-treated stained painted dimensional lumber. So that could be like a clean piece of two by four or a clean uh, piece of cedar from an old fence. Something like that, nothing that's been painted, stained or treated because that's a contamination for us on our end. So just grinding up with another simple green waste material and then bringing it to us is, is, is what we would like, what we want to request and require for this. 
and it's it has it has to do with contamination 100 percent and tanner's going to talk a little bit more about that here yeah so contamination is a big factor with compost um that's something so we'll get into the uh contracts that caitlin mentioned before we'll get into that in just a minute but with that, there's a little clause that if we have a load that comes in with a lot of contamination, then we're going to have to reject the load. So you can see uh, in this picture, um, I know that all of the uh, marijuana plants when you're growing them have to have uh, these plastic tags on them. Well, that's something that would be a contamination to us. So that would need to be removed prior to sending any green waste, any organic waste to our facility. Also, uh, soils, so all soils should be removed from the roots before sending roots to us. Uh, plastic, like I just said, that could be these tags, that could be um, the little plastic uh, pots that the plants are grown in. Um, just any other types of plastic associated with the material or with any packaging, all packaging should be removed. Um, fiberglass is also a big thing that we can see in this. Um, I know that there's some um, well fiberglass pucks that you can use to grow marijuana and those uh, fiberglass doesn't break down in composting and so that can just um, any contamination that we receive pretty much carries through the composting process doesn't get broken down and just ends up in the final product so you can see that in this picture <clears throat> excuse me right there on the left um, that was a small piece of plastic that was mixed in with organic waste and all the organic waste around it broke down into good compost, but then the plastic waste just carries through. And there's not really a way to remove that in composting. I feel like some, uh, there might be a misunderstanding sometimes that while well, there's just a small amount of plastic that can be removed, they can pull that out. Um, well, there's not really a process to do that. We're a very big composting company. We process, like Clinton said, hundreds of thousands of tons of material. And so we can't pick through that one by one to pick out the individual stickers as we go. So that's something that um, just kind of waste prep on the growers end um, that needs to be done beforehand. So pretty much all material that needs to go to us, the shorthand for contamination that I think of is, are you willing to put whatever that material is into the ground? So uh, that would obviously exclude any plastic materials or tape or other types of waste or fiberglass. Great, thanks, Tanner. Um, another thing we just wanted to touch on, and uh, I was really happy Caitlin um, showed this slide too, is, is the nutrient recycling. Like, why are we doing this? What, why is it so important? Why are we, the sustainable uh, benefits? Like, like what, why, are we, why are we doing this? So like the greenhouse gas reduction, like Caitlin had pointed out in Colorado landfills. I mean, a tremendous amount of methane and carbon dioxide is created from entombing this material in a Colorado landfill. Um, and then again, the nutrient storehouse, like the mature compost that we're gonna create um, from, from these materials coming into us and that nutrient and those microorganisms that are essential to plant health growth are gonna be back in that material that can be reused and recycled back into the same plant that it came from. The value there is tremendous. We call that, you see here, I have CTCL, that's closing the compost loop. It's exactly what we're talking about is we're, we're diverting these amazing materials that I like to call natural resources and turning them back into a, re, a usable soil amendment compost that can continue to grow these, these plants. And then again, of course, adding compost back into the ground or adding it back into your soil. If you're an outside grower, if you're in a field, you can reduce your water use. You actually, by increasing the organic matter levels within your soil, you can save on water use. And that is extremely important here in the state of Colorado. And then uh, if we could go back to just a slide real quick, Clinton. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention with the uh, closing compost loop and the nutrient recycling, is that um, we know that uh, cannabis pulls a lot of nutrients up from the soil. And so it's a pretty, it kind of creates a nutrient deprived soil by transporting all the nutrients up into the plant itself. Well, if you just take all that organic waste and you send that right to the landfill, then you're just, you're ending the loop and you're disposing of all these nutrients that could have otherwise been reused. And so if you send that to composting, then those nutrients that were in the plant now get to be 
reprocess into compost that can then be used by new plants. So it pretty much just reduces, you know, need for additional synthetic fertilizers by just reusing the nutrients that were already used up by the plants. Exactly. So then in the next slide, that's just talking about what uh, Caitlin had mentioned about the contracts. So according to uh, the language that we have here, we are a quote unquote unlicensed composter in the sense that we don't have a marijuana license. We aren't licensed through MED, but we are licensed composters to be clear. Um, <clears throat> And we do have a waste management plan like Caitlin was mentioning. And so we would just need uh, contracts for any regulated marijuana business. So that would be any growers and also any haulers that are bringing us any of this material. So we have some contact information there for uh, another person at our company, Scott Pexton. He is the contact for anybody who wants to send us materials and get contracts and figure out pricing. Um, in the composting world, we call that tipping. So he is the tipping manager. So that will all go through him. And uh, we have other information on the next slide, but I am the uh, technical person. So if there are questions of, can I mix this with my uh, waste? Can I use this instead? Um, will this you know, type of mixing work for you? Uh, those questions can be directed to me. My contact information will be on the next slide. Yeah. Great, thank you, Tanner. And yeah, let me just reiterate, um, again, here is all of our contact information. So you have Tanner there and me, Clinton Sander, and then again, Scott Paxton, who is our sales account manager responsible for incoming feedstocks, which we consider cannabis and the tipping for that. Uh, A1 has set up a URL right there on our website for cannabis recycling. It's currently not live just yet, so don't go run in there right now. Um, but all this information and what we would require on our end for you guys to, to bring the material to us and process and any, any other additional information will be located right there as a resource for you guys. And, um, and just to reiterate real quick is A1 Organics, again, we're, we're a leader in composting here in the state of Colorado, and we want to see all of this material specifically stay out of the landfills. So we are a resource. We are here to help don't hesitate to reach out and ask questions, anything that you guys would need, reach out to one of us on that list and um, we'll, we'll work through this and make sure that everything is, is in place and all of this valuable material stays out of landfill and we can reuse it and reuse it. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Clinton and Sandra uh, and Tanner. Um, great stuff. And again, for, for everybody in the audience, um, we will be sending out these presentations. And for those of you watching the recording, um, you can certainly get in touch with either the council or with Meg, and, and we can arrange for the presentations to be sent out. Um, a good email address for the council is just info at cannabiscert.org. So next up, we have John Whiteside from IHR Recycling. John uh, is the founder and CEO of IHR. Um, they do, you know, green waste management in the Denver metro area uh, and have great expertise around um, waste management. So, and it looks like we might have lost John, or is he here? Can you, no, uh, can you hear me? Others. I apologize. Hey, John. Can, yes, can sir. you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Take it. I was just uh, sitting here listening to Caitlin and Tanner and um, A1, and it's it's really gonna be a situation where we reiterate uh, how important it is to um, really divert at the source. So as a waste hauler, um, I started about 10 years ago in the business and the laws as they changed year to year, we kind of had to uh, figure out, but this is a great change that's happening here in 2021. And it will improve the way that you can manage the waste on site at your own facility by, you know, initially doing all of the disposal very responsibly in the very beginning from the generator standpoint so that you don't create these problems in the back end for the A1s at the end game. And so we've our five points deal with looking at the different streams of, of waste and being very specific about how you um, divert and how you separate all those different streams right there at the time that you're harvesting or that you're growing at the facility. So um, one thing we, we wanna do is continue to reiterate the safety and 
um, security by designating areas within your facility that are under the video surveillance that can be very easily identified to show, you know, fibers material goes in a bin. This uh, soil, we have a load to haul system. It's um, using our trailer system. And so if you look at the, the transport methods that exist to manage the material, on this slide, it'll show through a bin system, you can manage the green waste very easily. And then using a load to haul system with the trailers, you can manage your soil very easily. And if we really take the time to uh, eliminate things like the plastics and the non-organic material that shouldn't be in with the streams of waste that come out of the grow facilities, you really make the process um, very simple and fast and easy for everybody involved thereafter. So one of the things that we want to be diligent about is um, making sure that you, the operator, understand what you can do today to, at the very beginning, at the source, dispose the material so that it's ready to go once it leaves the facility. And as a hauler, we, we want to make it easy to take custody. And so we want to make sure that we have a log and that you have a log that's very consistent with what you're putting in metrics so you know the weights and the capacity of how much you're throwing away. And so that way, all of that will allow us to then take the material, take it to a transfer station, compile it into its separate streams of waste, and then divert it and take it to the A1 facilities and places that will then use the material to make other ancillary products. So um, the diligence of taking the time to reduce your carbon footprint, for example, with the soil, using grow vessels that you can reuse instead of plastic grow vessels, you use a hard plastic grow vessel that you can then clean out and reuse for your next harvest. Um, just really taking a look at every step in the process where waste is, is being created and trying to reduce the number of times that you or your staff have to touch the material so that it can then be disposed of very properly into the right receptacles in the, in the right places so that it's very easy to manage thereafter. So I know we probably all sound um, like we're reiterating the same thing, which is important because with green waste, the stalks, the stems, the fan leaves, the roots, one of the process we would have to do with the soil is as we remove the soil, we'd have to pulverize the, the root bulb and get the soil separated um, because of the high content of salts and things that are in that, that uh, grow medium. Like, um, And so we just want to make sure that people would understand that there's a very simple process that you can follow. And as a result, you know, in the long term, you look at where the material is taken to the methods of transport and how we can avoid sending it to the landfills. And that allows us to then create a next step in the continuum of using this material to make the nutrient rich compost and reducing the greenhouse gas effects. Um, I think it's so important that people just understand that where they grow it and where they throw it away is the point that it needs to start at the generator. And if you follow a very simple process, um, the safety, the security, everything is the public safety, uh, even dealing with the material on that time sensitive gradient where it decomposes, we can keep track of things. And ironically, 365, 3,650 tons translates to like 100 tons a day that we would have to, to manage. So, I mean, it, it makes sense to start at the generator and work all the way through to the composter. Sorry about that, John. I'll, I'll get the screen share back up. Um, and it seems like your feed might be a little lagging. So I just wanna quickly make sure that we touch on the five points that uh, IHR came up with. So very quickly um, to reiterate, it's really critical to separate material at every step um, and also to keep the waste in specific containers. Um, another point from them is diligence during harvest. Uh, really critical, and this is something that Tanner and Clinton touched on, to keep the organic and non-organic waste separated. 
because if that plastic is mixed in there, it's it's not going to work effectively at the end at the end for A1, and it's also going to make the process for IHR harder. Um, it, it screws up the weights and all the rest of that, um, and I'll get into that uh, right well in a moment. So another thing to consider, another suggestion from IHR is to consider a hard plastic grow vessel to allow for reuse. So it's very common, as many of you know, to use bags for the grow vessel. Um, those are not able to be reused and using something that is a hard plastic that you can wash and use over and over and over again is a really simple, elegant way to reduce waste going to landfill. Uh, another key step coming from IHR recycling, temperature control storage and designated area for organic waste. This will enhance hygiene and facilitate transfer of custody. So a, a critical thing to note here is that mold and mildew starts at 68 degrees. So if you keep your, your organic waste in a, in, a, in a separate area, well you know, uh, uh, separated, et cetera, and keep it in a temperature controlled environment, it's a great way to keep mold, keep mildew out of your facility. Um, another critical point uh, and something else that A1 touched on too is for maintenance. It's really critical that the pickup form is updated weekly. So if you have a third party waste management company, there's a pickup form that you guys essentially collaborate with uh, to make sure that the weights and the transfers are all noted. It's really important for that paperwork to be maintenance weekly to track volume and weight and which is water loss because when IHR picks up the organic waste, um, there's still a lot of water in, in the biomass that, that evaporates and leaves as they move it around and haul it and get it to their site. So by the time it gets into their auspices, it weighs less and that's fine. MED and everybody else is prepared for that, but it's really important for the weight to be uh, monitored and noted correctly at every phase so that the evaporation is consistent with the time that's elapsed. Um, another item with paperwork from IHR is to make sure that the waste contact information and the person that is doing that work is updated monthly. Um, it may be the same person for the whole year, that's fine. You just need to continue to make sure that every month that that's refreshed and that everybody is very clear on who is doing what. Um, and again, that's really because of the weight issues. They, everybody must know the original weight of the waste uh, and then the end weight after all of the evaporation occurs, which is when IHR will be in uh, possession of it. Um, the weight, just to be clear, pertains, pertains to fibrous material, not soil or root bulbs. Um, and then a final bonus point, so a sixth point from IHR, is to clean your bins. Use water or hydrogen peroxide and keep them locked. So one of the things that can come up with the waste bins is that if they're not clean, uh, you can get residual you know, mold, mildew, weight, all kinds of problems that you don't want. And these kinds of practices of just cleaning your waste bins regularly, again, with water or hydrogen peroxide, simply enhance the hygiene of your facility. So uh, with that, um, that, and again, that's all from IHR and, and I apologize for Stepping in there, we just wanted to make sure we got a good clear feed. Um, so with that, we will hand it off to Brandon Rea from Native Roots. Brandon is their head of science and sustainability, a cultivator extraordinaire. And Brandon is gonna share from the perspective of a cultivator and a cultivation. So Brandon, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to, to you and uh, Truman and Mig for putting these on um, and other panelists for sharing their knowledge. Um, so I'm going to quickly kind of speak from the operator's perspective a little bit and try not to be too redundant with some of the stuff that uh, the other panelists talked about um, and hopefully save a little time for questions and answers at the end. Um, I'll try to speak, I'll, I'll speak a little bit specific to our process, but try to keep it a little bit general. Um, we're a vertically integrated company here in Colorado as so we grow, have the MIP and stores. Um, we also have uh, retail operations in Canada. Uh, but also just make sure you're kind of thinking of this from your unique perspective and uh, customized because some of this will vary. Um, first thing that they've kind of talked about previously is just step one is identifying your organic and your non-organic waste streams. 
um, whether it's the plant waste, the, the grow media, which again, depending on what the grow media is and um, whether you're able to separate the root balls that might change whether it really is compostable or not. Um, so kind of looking at those streams internally first and knowing what you're dealing with uh, is a good first step to start with. And then just thinking about all the other materials, if you have kitchen waste and other things that could be compostable, seeing, making sure you can integrate that into that system um, and make sure you're not contaminating either. And as I said, just make sure you're kind of customizing this to your facility. I'm gonna talk a lot from the cultivation perspective, um, but there are opportunities for MIPS and retail operations as well. Uh, so definitely don't think that I'm excluding you in that front. And then just throwing a few pictures here, um, like they talked about, uh, you have a lot of different waste streams and some of them you need to make sure you keep separate um, so that they don't contaminate it and the material can actually be composted and used on the back end. Um, and again, this is going to vary for operations, but some of these, the stalks and stems are going to be pretty standard um, and haulers and processors should be pretty familiar with those. Uh, but just make sure you're identifying that and kind of have all the info before you reach out to those haulers and uh, ask those questions. One thing to kind of think about early on as you're looking at your waste streams is how that's going to impact your processes. Um, are you going to have to get more containers in the, the location to separate um, leaves from the ones that have like hair nets and gloves and all the other stuff that it can't be composted. Um, maybe it's all going in there together right now to kind of be mixed 50-50, um, but you'll just have to divert those and segregate those moving forward. Um, so, you know, you need to think about receptacles both inside and outside the facility. And also think about just the, the training required. Um, this gets into some of those often tedious logistics of updating SOPs and doing some retraining of employees and stuff. But I'd encourage you to think of that more as an opportunity than a challenge um, to kind of tell employees why you're doing it, that you're trying to get this material to be composted and used in a more sustainable way. And that's a good way to, to build sustainability into the culture and just show employees what their direct day-to-day -day, uh, job functions impact in a, a positive way. Um, so again, I just make sure you're kind of communicating that, thinking about it as a team internally um, and framing it in a positive way, not just uh, one more challenge and thing for them to do and have to separate stuff out. And then uh, lastly, obviously, you have to figure out where that organic waste goes. Um, and I think if I could just sum this slide up in one word, it's communication. Just make sure you're talking to your hauliers, talking to your end processors, and making sure you understand what's going into each waste stream. Um, depending on your operation, you might have organic or recyclable. You might have some hazardous waste. You might have some stuff that has to go to landfill. Um, but don't just assume what those are. Um, if you're unsure about something, reach out and ask the, the right people. Um, don't do wishful composting and just throw stuff in there and be like, I bet they can compost that because uh, like A1 said, they don't have a, something built in their process to remove contaminations and things like that. So uh, the easier and the more uncontaminated you can make those waste, waste streams, the more usable the product is and a lot easier to probably make the lives of the haulers and processors on the back end. Um, and also, just want to point out that some of this might vary by locality. If you're in rural Colorado, it might be different near, if you're in Denver or Boulder. Um, so some of these uh, might be different or they might be unavailable or you might just have to reach a little bit further to find them. Um, but as you are doing that, uh, the Cannabis Certification Council and the BMP Guide are great resources. Everybody on this panel, I know, is always happy to talk sustainability, so you can always reach out to them. Um, but that BMP Guide is a good start as well. Uh, we've talked a lot about external composting here, but I think it's worth highlighting too that you do have, as Caitlin said, the option to repurpose internally. Um, and one good example of that is Smokies. They have a, a great case study in the BMP that talks about their kind of closed, more closed loop living soil system um, and some opportunities there. So if you want to get creative, um, there's lots of opportunities. Um, and last thing, uh, just make sure you're keeping in mind those MED regulations that everybody has touched on. Uh, MED has been fantastic working with the Cannabis Certification Council, the MED or the Denver uh, Sustainability Work Group at updating these rules to allow these more sustainable operations. It's important that we do that the right way and we follow the, the things that are necessary. Um, they've been so helpful in changing these rules that we don't want to take advantage by being sloppy and not doing it right. So just make sure you're following those. As you all, if you've been in the industry for more than a couple of weeks, you know it's a highly regulated industry and we need to stay on our toes. And um, it's a good way to stay diligent with that and be more green. So that was kind of a quick run through. Um, so I'll send it back over to Ben 
um, open up for questions and closing it out. Brandon, that was great. And a, a great way to sum it up, uh, particularly from your perspective. And thank you for mentioning the best management practices guide. I put that in the chat for, for folks that are here live. And for those of you that will be tuning in later, um, again, you can reach out to us at info at canvascert.org for the best management practices guide. So we did have a handful of questions in the Q&A function, and I appreciate Caitlin and Tanner and, and Clinton, I think, went in there and answered. Um, I, I will just quickly open it up to the panel um, if they wanna speak to any of the questions or if there are any other issues or, or items that have come up between us um, that you'd like to address, let's quickly just uh, hear what those are. Uh, and then we'll, we'll close out shortly here. So I, anything from the panel or did, did anybody wanna to speak to one of the questions? I have uh, just a point of clarity. Um, a couple of the questions were kind of surrounding this. So just an overall theme of once this waste is composted, it's a compost, it's compost. It's no longer a regulated marijuana waste. It's just compost and it can be used just as compost. Um, so I think that's, that's an important distinction to make that you know once the stock steams stock stems, leaves, uh, root balls, leave the facility at, and go to the composter and by action of composting, it is now compost. It is unusable, unrecognizable by the action of composting and is no longer, like I said, regulated as a marijuana waste. And to speak just from the composting perspective on that, um, besides the fact that it will be just compost under regulations, I mean, you could see in the picture that was in our presentation that the feedstocks are completely unrecognizable. So you aren't going to be going through and find an entire fan leaf in compost. That's not how it works. It breaks it down entirely into pretty much its base parts. So you won't be able to tell that cannabis was a feedstock. Great stuff, guys. Um, you know, with that, I, I think we'll wrap it up. So I just want to close by saying, um, to, well, by close by thanking everyone again, um, starting with all of our panelists and speakers, Tanner Phelps, Clinton Sander, Brandon Rea, John Whiteside, Caitlin Urso. Special thank you to Kat Cottespotti who does so much. Uh, thank you to you, Kat. And Truman Bradley, you are the man. Thank you so much for emphasizing sustainability um, to your membership and through the marijuana industry group. For folks listening, I suspect many of you are members of MIG. If you are not a member of MIG, what are you doing? If you're in the cannabis industry in this state and you're not a member of MIG, are you really in the, in the industry? I think it's a valid question. Um, so please go to the MIG website, marijuanaindustrygroup.org, check them out, contact them, sign up. Uh, it has tremendous value. And a shameless plug for us also, the Cannabis Certification Council, we produce the Cannabis Sustainability Symposium. We'll be doing nine of those events this year. We have eight more coming. Our next one is on Earth Day, April 22nd. It'll be about carbon and cannabis. So very excited about that. Um, and finally, the next deep dive event will be on April 29th. We'll be talking about water and how to manage your water more sustainably. So we'll have, I think Caitlin will back. I can't quite recall, but Caitlin's going to be on a bunch of these. So <laughs> she's the usual suspect. Um, and we'll have another really just outstanding lineup of experts for um, Colorado operators. And just as a tip for those of you around the country or abroad, um, we are going to also be developing these deep dive um, events and, and seminars for other markets. Um, so very excited about that. And just, again, incredibly grateful to Truman and Kat and Mig for their leadership on this. So thank you everyone for joining and for attending. Thank you for the thoughtful questions and the wonderful information. If you were paying attention, you should have received by my count about 21 specific tips that you can use in your business starting today to become more sustainable with your waste management. So this was just really wonderful. Um, and thank you to, again to everybody. So with that, we are gonna sign off and we'll see you on YouTube.